people that are miserable, I never understand why they're doing what they're doing. You have one life. We got one shot at this. There's no dress rehearsals at all. And it, to to be miserable going to job after job after, or just doing the same thing over and over again to have no inspiration, you know, you're just a cog in a wheel. I'd rather be the engine. I'd rather be the one that drives and moves the car, you know, than just be the wheel. Over the course of his career, A.J. Buckley has appeared in more than 30 prominent feature films and television series. He's currently best known for his role as fan favorite Sonny Quinn in the hit series Seal Team. He's been major characters in successful productions like CSI New York, Narcos, Pure, The Good Dinosaur by Pixar, Sony Pictures Home Sweet Hell, which he also helped write and produce. And here's a little behind the scenes. AJ was born in Ireland and then immigrated to Canada at the age of six. It was in British Columbia, Canada where he began his acting career, guest starring on shows like The X-Files. AJ is also a thriving entrepreneur with a number of successful ventures. He's a husband, a dad, and he not only plays a Navy SEAL, but he trains like one. And we're going to get into all of them. AJ Buckley, welcome to Motiversity. Thank you, guys. It's, 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 uh, it's an honor to be here. Thanks for having me. Likewise. It's... Uh... You know, just looking back over the accomplishments you've had in your career, it's, it's extraordinary what you've done. And you were born in Ireland and then immigrated to Canada at the age of six. We're actually based in Canada, so fellow Canadians in that regard. How much did moving and growing up in Canada shape who you are today? Um, well, the thing with Irish, uh, the Irish and Canadians are very similar in how nice they are um, and how welcome they are. Um, I... I I remember, and everybody, you know, you can always spot a Canadian accent. You can always spot a, an Irish accent. When I when I first came to Canada, I remember going to school and people called me like the the luck, Lucky Charms or the Leprechaun or whatever it was. Or anytime anybody had uh, a, a, a cereal box with the Lucky Charms, they they'd bring it over to my desk. That was kind of the ongoing joke. Um, but um, so then my accent over the years, I kind of had this Irish Canadian weird thing and then started to work on an American accent so it was just a big mush of everything um, but uh, but yeah the, the 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 growing up in Canada just gave me a real appreciation for um, at the outdoors and uh, you know skiing and snowboarding and hiking and 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 then you know falling in love with the sport hockey with my my dad when we came over and, and going to my first hockey game at um, God what was it was the was the Colise it was the Coliseum where the Canucks used to play, I think it was, um, uh, before it got torn down. And uh you know, just being a part of that and you know, I feel really lucky that my parents had chose Vancouver, it was such a beautiful place. We lived out in a place called White Rock, which was um closer to the American border. And um yeah, I was there till I was about seventeen years old. Right after I graduated I I left Canada and, and ended up moving down to the States. And, and you did that, I mean, you did the thing that everyone, or not everyone, but a lot of people dream of becoming a successful actor and you started in Vancouver. How did it actually happen? Was it like a lucky break for you or was it years of hard work? <laughs> it's a, uh, yeah, it's a, uh, I always, I always laugh when people are like overnight success. It's like, you know, mm -hmm. there's a, there's a, like a, a great picture of, that I always refer to there's like of where you see like an iceberg and you see like the tip of that coming out and then the years of hard work are like below the ocean until you just sort of the tip comes out where the mountain comes out or whatever you want to call it but it, it was a grind I mean you know and like I said I've been incredibly lucky and fortunate in my career to get to the place I am now but it has not come without an incredible amount of 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 hard work and sacrifice and I was I my very first gig was on the X-Files um notable gig I'd done like small parts here and there but my first notable gig was on the X-Files um and it was a recurring role as um Agent Scully's brother and then they brought me back randomly to do this episode called War of the Cockroaches and they sort of killed off his brother and then I'd grown up a little bit so then they brought me back to do um uh, this War of the Cockroaches episode, which was really cool, which is another fellow Canadian, Tyler Labine, um, 
uh, who's actually him and I be, be remain really good friends over the years. He's on New Amsterdam and just a hell of an actor and hell of a guy. And um, but we, we we've had very similar past because we kind of came down roughly around the same time. And then I got a I landed a pretty significant role in a film called Disturbing Behavior um, with uh, Katie Holmes, James Marsden, and Nick Stahl, and the director was David Nutter. And I remember I was, I was laying sod um, in my parents' backyard and Nutter had called and he was like, he's like, hey, we want to talk to you. You know, your character's testing really high. And, and I didn't even know what that meant. He, he's like, so you should, you should, you know, think about coming down to Los Angeles. And I went and talked to my dad. He's like, you're 17. He's like, you know. And so then Nutter talked to my dad and he's like, look, I'll, I'll, you know, he had a family and he's like, he can stay with us. And you know, we'll I'll help him get an agent and, and whatnot. He's like, but this is a big, big deal. You're, you're, you know, your son's character is testing significantly higher than the rest of the cast. So it, it could be some good momentum for him to come down to the States and at least, you know, just explore it and, and see how it is. So we, we packed up and the goal was sort of, you know, go down there for three months and give, give it a crack and see what's up and then go. And sure enough, I went down, I met an agent and the first role I went out for ended up booking and I was like, oh, wow, this is crazy. So then I got like my O one one visa and so on and so forth. Um, but it was, you know, the the road from what I thought from that moment when I booked my first gig at, to, to sort of the years that happened prior to like my next big break was pretty insane. Um, and it just, I look back and just like sort of <laughs> how naive I was. I'm like, I'm right. I'm in LA. I booked my first movie and this is it you know but i still actually have there's a bunch of uh, memorabilia and i have that the script i remember showing up on set that morning and i've always been a big visualization person and i don't know why even before i knew that was something i kind of always did it i had things in my head um you know, that I just kind of was really clear on that I knew I was going to get there. I knew I always wanted, I always knew I wanted to be an actor. Even before I, I found out what acting was, I wanted to do it. And it was just something that was inside me. And it was, it was actually in Ireland when I was watching Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs at a, a play. And every time the, the, um, the dwarves came out on stage, they would laugh they'd make one of them would make him laugh and th i could feel in the theater this like it was like a tingling in my ear and i kept looking around to see what the, i'd never heard like an auditorium at once laugh mm -hmm. and it was just tickling and tickling tickling so i i said to my mom i was like what 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 are what are those people doing like those are actors and i was like i said to my mom i was like that's what i want to do and i was like you know four and a half five years old and from that day forth i was like i wanted to either be on the stage or whatever it was but the bug was in me and it was something that again I, I don't know I just knew I could see it clearly in my head and then driving onto that set I always remember saying to myself when I get when I get my first gig in Los Angeles because that from Van, from Vancouver when you were you know amongst all the other actors and stuff and you'd hear about somebody get to go off to LA and do a movie it was like oh wow that's you know they've made it that's that's it. They're gone. They're gone to LA to do a movie. And so you kind of had, that's the way my brain was working. And then I had shown up on this movie and, uh, you know, sitting in the parking lot. And I remember taking out my, the top of my script and wrote down like the date and the time. And I was like, you know, you know, you dream it, you believe it, you know, you know, this is, I was like, this is the first of many. Um, it was like, I was almost talking in myself like a third person. It was really strange. And I wrote this thing and like put it in my back in my, my little actor bag and uh um yeah but it's just something that i i'll never forget that moment there's very few moments along the way that I've, I've i've sort of dreamt about or i've seen in my head and then it sort of um it sort of happens as 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 the journey is as uh continued were there any low points in that journey oh so many oh so many um yeah it was you know i booked a couple gigs down in los angeles and, um, you know, I, I kind of gotten lost a little bit in the sense of I've never really lived alone. I didn't really have a good grasp of what taxes were. Um, and, uh, 
which are surprise taxes. What are those? <laughs> you know. So I'd made it, you know, a good chunk of money, and I would just thought the money that was in my bank account was mine. And I ended up having, you know, I having not. I did have any money in my bank account at one point. And, you know, then I'd book a gig and and then I kind of, I, I took the foot off the gas a little bit because I got distracted by the, the, the pretty lights of Los Angeles and going out and partying and, you know, being something that I'm completely wasn't raised to be. But it's definitely something you go through in life. And I had some help from like, some friends were giving me some money, this or that, because I might go, you know, money would come in and or I'd book a gig and I'd pay some back or my parents would help me out. And then I finally just realized that I couldn't take another dollar from another person and because it was just for this safety blanket. And I kind of said to myself and said to my parents and things like, look, I'm not going to take another dollar unless it's a dollar I, I earn on myself. And um, that choice was I didn't have any money, so I needed to sort of put put the gas back on. So I ended up moving into my car and I had all my stuff, all my everything I possessed was in my car. And for probably about a year, um, I would couch surf and whatnot. The guy at the gym, um, Eduardo, God bless him, he never checked my pass. He just would always say, hey, good morning, Eduardo, and he just buzzed me in, thinking that I paid all the time So and until he figured it out, which he never did. I'd go in there and shower at the gym and get a workout in, and um, and but it was it – was, uh, I remember having – I had a conversation with myself in my, my rearview mirror, and I was like, do I go back to Canada and, you know, because I was 26 at the time and, you know – and I'm living in my car, you know, it's, it's just, there's not, you know, I'm supposed to be living the dream. I left Vancouver and well, I made it, you know, like people think that I've made it and, and I hadn't, but then I really kind of, you know, started thinking, I was like, look, I've, I've got everything right now. I've got my health. I've got, I'm chasing my dream. Um, I got people that believe in me. I have a legitimate agent. So maybe I do have everything. You know, material-wise, I'm, I'm struggling a little bit, but I have everything that I need right now at this moment that I need to get a job. And it's just I needed to focus in on what that I, – I needed to stop worrying about, you know, the next three or four years and just focus what I could control. And that was being completely focused and present on the work and tasks that I had at hand to get me out of the situation that I was in. And be okay with telling people that I had no money and I think that I was broke and that I was struggling um, and lose my ego over that because I wasn't raised that way. My father never raised me that way. We didn't grow up with money. It never defined us. So I, I had kind of gotten lost in this sort of flashy town of like, yeah, you're doing great. You know, Everybody asks how you're doing down here and, and people tell you what jobs they've just worked on as opposed to telling you how you're actually doing. You know. Your work defines you as opposed to your character. Um, so I needed to kind of get back into that. And I remember talking to myself, did I drive back home to get a nine to five? I'm not that there's anything wrong with a nine to five job in Vancouver, but I was just like, that is not me. Like I, I can't go home like this. Like I, I don't feel like I even gave it a real shot. So I, I, I like actually gone out. I, I had some girl that I took out on a date and I usually would eat before, so I, I could because I didn't have a lot of money, so like, we wouldn't go out anywhere special. Like, well, I already ate, or we just get like a coffee or something or whatnot. And this girl, like, <laughs> we went up to this up by Mulholland, and um, I really liked her too. And she she was like, "So where do you live?" And I kind of pulled off to the side, and and I was parked right in front of this beautiful house, like just like probably $10 million house on Mall, And she's like, so where do you live? And, and I'm like, okay, the, AJ, this is where you just be honest for the first time. And you're just going to say, I live right here, right here. And she's like, holy shit, this is your house? I'm like, oh, no, this is terrible. I'm like, oh, God, this is, you can't recover from this. I'm like, okay. And I'm like, no, 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 that's not my house. She's like, well, what do you mean? I'm like, well, I live here in my car. She's like, you live in your car? I'm like, yeah. And I'm like, that's my suitcase. She's like, you need to take me home right now. I'm like, okay. I'm like, <laughs> so that didn't go well. But then I just kind of like laughed it off and 
and he became comfortable with, you know, you know, if someone had asked, like, yeah, it sucks right now, like, but, you know, I'm, I'm figuring it out and making it work, you know, it was, I'd sort of flipped the perspective of, like, having no money to a positive and, 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 and looking at the, how much opportunity I had in front of me as opposed to, I didn't have money and I'm not going to be able to do anything. It just, it, I became more creative and more hungry than I'd ever been. And, um, and probably within, I'd say a month of that, within a couple of weeks, uh, CSI New York came about and I had read for, um, them in the past. And I knew I was on their list of lab techs that they wanted to try. Um, and, uh, they, I, I was brought in, um, to, to, to cause they were going through them cause the wording was like, you have to say these giant words and it's opposite Gary Sinise and they were just looking for this certain type of character. So my agent called me and was like, Hey, listen, they want to test you out for uh, a new character, but they're not going to do any sort of test deal until, or like any contract until they, you've done a couple episodes for them. So, so this is your sort of screen test in a sense. And I'm like, Okay, and like they're like you start tomorrow. They're gonna write a scene. I'm like, oh man, and I have an incredible learning disability. Like I need time with my script, just the way my brain works. Um, and so um, I sh I get this script, and they're like, it could change because they're writing it. They're just doing it right now. Um, and there's like these massive words that like alicicla carboxylic and like aspergillus sedawi guadalupe teru teru. You know, methoxydiacylpropyl trip to me like these crazy words that I'm like what in the, like this is you know and I, I only remember those words because they fucking haunt me they still haunt me I have anxiety dreams over them like I'm like oh my god I'm given the biggest opportunity in my life and this is like it's like having a, a dream where you show up to set and you're naked you know it's like the same thing so I was like oh no and there's Gary Sinise and like I love Forrest Gump and you know every other movie that he's done and he's like such a, an amazing actor and He's the nicest guy in the world, but when he's on set, he's very focused. So he just has this sort of stare. And that's his character. But I, I, I was like, oh, God, fumbling and nervous. And I'm going through the, the scene, and I knock over like a beaker, and I'm super nervous. And he's going, and and uh, in my head, I'm like, I'm there. This is I'm fired. I'm not going to get past the first, the first take. And uh, I bumble through one of the big words, but he got through. And they said, cut. And the showrunner's like, AJ, I absolutely love the choice of making him super nervous and bumbling. What? This is great. Mm -hmm. So funny. Sure. You and Gary together. And I'm like, looking at him like, okay. And she's like, just keep doing that. I'm like, oh, okay. I can totally keep doing that. Like, it was just this. So it was just a fluke. And Gary loved it. He's like, that's great, kid. It's really funny what you're doing. I'm like, thanks. And I'm like, and then, which made me more nervous because then I'm like, I don't remember what I did. So it just kind of happened, and then they started writing. And the next time I came back, um, they wrote "Bumbling Adam," you know, walked into the scene. So it kind of added to this this thing that I was this nervous guy in the lab, which totally happened naturally. And then I had done a couple episodes, and um, uh, I was in the parking lot, and I had like thirty. Thirty-two dollars and ninety-five cents. I was in a Seven Eleven parking lot, and um, uh, that's all I had in my bank account. And I actually have that framed in my office. Um, and I, my phone rang, and it was my uh, manager saying that they wanted to do a seven-year deal with me at CBS, and it like completely changed my life, like going zero to sixty in a Tesla, and. and uh, it just everything everything changed um, for the better. I'm like I, I like <laughs> I like went out and got like um, I went out and got like an apartment that day. But I didn't just get an apartment. I got like this great one. I, I bought, got an apartment and bought a pool table. And my parents had come down to celebrate, and they came in. I didn't even have a bed or anything. There was a pool. Um, these guys were putting up a pool table. My mom's like, "Where's your bed or your plates?" I'm like, "I haven't bought that yet." And I'm, I'm like. And she's like, you bought a pool table? I'm like, I've always wanted to buy a pool table. She's like, Jesus Christ, AJ. <laughs> it's, like, it's like, it's great, though. We can play pool. She's like, but where are you going to sleep? And I'm like, I've got my car outside. <laughs> so, so, but, uh, but yeah, and then that, that, you know, ran for nine seasons and, you know, was, was an unbelievable thing. And I got to, you know, learn, you know, 
get to study um, one of the greats, Gary Sinise, and their his craft, and uh, and see how he ran a set. And I just learned so much. And Peter Lankoff, who's one of the showrunners, who's a fellow Canadian um, from Montreal, he's one of the showrunner writers. He's really become a, a huge mentor of mine in Los Angeles and just a great friend. Really kind of took me under his wing on the production side of things and the directing side and let me sit in on writing rooms and all sorts of stuff, which really then my mind sort of opened up into the whole other side of producing and directing and, and whatnot. But uh, yeah, that's sort of the, the Cliff Notes version of some lows and some highs. No kidding. Amazing. Yeah, what a story. And it's awesome how like your positive mindset really led you there, right? Like even when you were having those hardships, like that's that's huge. And you hear that often too, right? Like from other You gotta like it's like anything and I always anytime I try to explain to someone, it's like it's like reading a chapter and until you understand what happened in that chapter, you can never go to the next chapter. So you have to go back and read it again. And I feel like that was happening in my life. I had to until I understood where I was the next part wasn't going to happen. I was a dog chasing its tail. So I had to be okay at, with myself and where I was and kind of zero in on what my, what my goal was. And, and instead of, you know, taking the foot off the gas and going out and hanging out with people that really didn't give a shit about anything, you know, I needed to sort of bring the circle small and put the focus back on myself um, and it had that hunger again to get up and get after it. Um, and, and, and which today, you know, is, it's stronger than ever, even with the success that I have now, you know, it's, it's, it, the more that you are dialed in, you know, the more that the needle moves. And I think it's, it's things that there's, there's, I have a, I have, you know, it's, it's a problem in a sense too, cause my wife, is always like, look, you gotta, you gotta take your foot off just a little bit. But I always just feel like I've got to keep, keep just, you know, charging and charging and charging. And I, and I don't do it. And I'm not, if I'm not having a good time, like I absolutely love what I'm doing. I love being that, having that discipline. I love getting up before the sun rises. I love, you know, getting work done early before the sun rises and feeling accomplished and hitting the day strong. Um, that's just kind of who I am and, and it's a, it's a hard thing to turn off for sure on vacations and stuff like that. Um, but, uh, it's, it's just kind of who I am. For sure. I know the, I know the feeling when, when it comes to breaking out in, in a career as you have, what advice can you give to someone else who has, or who wants to break out in a career themselves, even one as difficult as acting? You have to be fearless. You have to be completely fearless um, and have utmost belief in whatever that that feeling is inside you um, you have to earn earn your keep earn the day um, but when you're stepping into territory that's unknown and we grow up in a society where people just think that you click on things and you get it you know we're, we're programmed everything is so instant or you know you take a pill you get skinny you know, you do, you, you get this app, it sorts everything out for you. Nothing comes, you know, with it's to get anything the, the there's no secret to it. It's just hard work. You got to put in the work. You got to put in the hours, whether it's repetitions or whether whatever it is, you got to get up and get after it as hard as you can, because there's somebody else that's out there that's doing it, you know, and there's a quote that the rock always says, who's somebody I always draw inspiration from because I don't know how he does everything that he does. But it truly is, and he remains to be such a big philanthropist and great person and always has a smile on his face, um, is that, you know, you want to be the hardest working person in the room. And it's true. And for someone that's, whatever career they're doing, if what they're going after truly makes them happy, you know, if, if, it's, if it's driven by happiness, they will have nothing but success. Because you will enjoy getting up early in the morning. You will enjoy outworking everybody. People that are miserable, I never understand why they're doing what they're doing. 
you have one life. We got one shot at this. There's no dress rehearsals at all. And it, to to be miserable going to job after job or just doing the same thing over and over again, to have no inspiration, you know, you're just a cog in a wheel, you know. I'd rather be the engine. You know, I'd rather be the one that drives and moves the car, you know, than just be the wheel. Um, uh, so it's... It's it's just it just it's and again it's all a mindset. It's how it's how bad do you want something, and um, it, nothing nothing tastes better than um, when you've earned it. it. There's no better feeling than when you've earned it, and nothing's been handed to me. Nothing you know has come. Nothing by any chance has come easy to me, but I wouldn't have it any other way because I don't think. I'd have the career that I have if I didn't go through what I did early and I, and sort of lose what I little fortune that I had at the time and get lost and then have to come back and, and sort of recalibrate. I don't think I'd be here what I, or if I was if, if I accepted, you know, people still handing, give me loan or this or that or because I, I, there was always a safety blanket. Rip that safety blanket out. Don't have a backup plan. If you have a backup plan, you'll always go to that backup plan. You know, you're like, oh, I have, well, I could always go back to this. Well, that means if it, what, if it gets too tough, that's like saying, if I get married, I can always get a divorce if it gets tough. You know, that's why so many people are divorced these days because they don't want to put the work in, you know, um, and it's like, or anything. It's like, just, just, you have to be able to, when, the, when it gets tough, you got to be able to b- bite down on your mouth guard and step forward and keep swinging. You know, there's, there's, there's those things that you just have to know that you know who who is the person inside you there's 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 some voice that talks that you talk to every day that everybody has you know there's something that you have and that's i call it just like that that inner will you know and if if you decide in that moment that you want to ring that bell and give up then okay then go to your go to your go to your backup plan and be miserable but if you want to do what it is and that it brings you happiness and the happiness is worth more than any dollar amount you'll ever have. That through your happiness, you'll you'll have your wealth that will come. I'm a firm believer of that. But I, I, I don't believe that doing something just for money is that you'll – there's no happiness in that because you're sur- – it's there's there's no passion. You know, you, people that are hungry and, and, and also too, I, I feel like you've got to surround yourself by people that are like-minded. You know, iron sharp sharpens iron. My dad always said that. You know, he said, my dad always said, show me your friends and I'll tell you who you are. You know, I think you need to surround yourself by people that are hard chargers that get up and that and they don't have to be in the same career, but they have the same values, you know, and our group of friends that we hang out, we all have an expectation of each other. You know, we all have some sort of level of expectation to be successful um, and, and, and just, you know, get at, just, if there is a, if there is a, a sliver of an opportunity, a sliver of a, of a chance, that means you got a chance, you know, and I, I play those odds every day with acting, you know, it's like how all of SAG 1% works as a career, but I saw that as a massive opportunity and I had no doubt that was, that, that. I could I could compete in that and now have I been you know it, it, is there some people that you're like hey look it might not be this but if you're in the creative space like redirect go into the writing go into the directing go into you know cinematography or whatever it is if it's the creative space you know just figure out exactly what it is but whatever you focus in don't give up you just can't and and by doing that you have to just be fearless you 100% have to be fearless. Completely agreed. Yeah. I think that mindset's going to resonate with a lot of people, AJ. Um, just that focus on working hard, that be fearless and never give up. And, and you didn't just, I mean, the mindset actually created a transformation for you. When I think about your role as CSI New York and then to a role of playing a Navy SEAL, you went through a massive transformation. What did that take to do that? Um, it was actually a couple of things. Um, 
there was it was just after my dad had passed away and I was on TSI and I kind of let myself go a little bit um, and CSI had ended and uh, I got an opportunity I I I I I I'd been drinking pretty heavy a lot more than um, I ever did in my life and I was just kind of in a, in a really dark place after losing my father and an opportunity came up and it was for a really big franchise pick and I screen tested and the director had called my team and said look he's the best guy for the job but physically we don't have enough time to get him in the shape that we need and my wife was pregnant at the time and I really I really felt like I'd let her down and let my daughter who was on the way down because I I'd taken the I lost focus and I and I knew that my dad would have been really disappointed in me how I was dealing with his death which is only you learn through you know nothing prepares you for stuff like that so I kind of had that same conversation and I made a promise to myself and and I knew that the role that I played on CSI wasn't the character that I wanted to play. I, my favorite character was ever is John McClane. I've always wanted to to play that type of character. It's always been a, um, a, 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 something again that I've always sort of in my head seen. And, you know so that type of just yippee ki motherfucker type of guy. You know. <laughs> Swinging, swinging under a helicopter with a cigar in my mouth, firing at things. You know, <laughs> it's just always, you know, just, it just, it just, he's a perfect character. It's just your every, your every man that you, you, uh, blue collar worker that you, you cheer for. Um, so I just had said to my wife, I said, look, I'm going to hire a trainer. Uh, I'm going to stop drinking. I'm going to get so focused and the best of me is, you know, in order for me to go into this next journey, this next chapter, the roles that I want to play and that I'm getting opportunities like that, that I just let, you know, slip through my hands. I'm like, that'll never happen again. And I just turned into a machine. You know, I've hired this amazing trainer and, um, this new, I went and met this nutritionist and, um, I, I, I put, while I wasn't working, I went into full, full Rocky mode and ended up, going and shooting this film that I produced. So I don't know what this is coming here. So sorry. Um, um, I ended up going to shoot this, uh, shoot this film that I was producing and I put on a bunch of size for the, for the role. And, um, that role, uh, a producer at one of the screenings, um, saw me, saw my performance of that and he was a producer of Justified. And he brought me over to Justified, and then my performance on Just and I, this is still while my body was going through this transformation. You can kind of see in the course of the episode of the uh, of Justified how much my body starts changing over that season. By the end of the when I finished Justified, I, I got put on um, this uh, uh, when it started airing. The uh, Entertainment Weekly has this thing that would come out was called like Emmy watch list, like different people that are, you know, should be put on. And my manager called me, I was actually my publicist, Beth called me. She's like, she's like, Oh shit, you're you made like the, the Emmy watch. And I was like, what me? And so this is the, this is the, this is how crazy this business is. So I get off that and I'm getting in this really good, like the best shape I've ever been in. And then I, I get offered this uh, character on pure, um, which was a Canadian show. Um, um, and the character in the first season, Bronco Novak was his name. He's this alcoholic deadbeat cop. And I had a conversation with the, uh, director and he's like, you know, um, you're, we were doing a, a zoom call and he was just like, you're in pretty good shape. He's like, I need you to put on some weight though for me. And I'm like, what? <laughs> he's like, <laughs> Cause he's like, I'd love for you to, at the beginning of, the series be a little heavier set and then your character stops drinking and gets his stuff together and then we really see a transformation. He's like, would you be open to do something like that? I like to start laughing. I'm like, of course, I literally just lost all this weight and now you want me to put it back on. But I was like, 
this is great because then I, I've actually never done this before. Put on, you know, fat for a roll deliberately. So I was like, all right. So I literally go back to like eating pizza late at night and hogging dogs, you know, out of a bottle and just feeling like crap. So I, I probably put like 15, I had about a month, probably put like 15, 16 pounds of just grossness back on. And it's just sweaty and, um, and then show up there. And then the, the second I got there, I just switched. I actually worked with this um, amazing trainer um, in Nova Scotia, Adrian Van Uh And uh, he just, we, we went in, like, I, I was like, I have four months of shooting and I want to get as shredded as possible. And it just, it just worked out perfect. I put on all this weight and then the, the, after the first week that I was there, zeroed in, and then dropping like 25 pounds, but putting on like eight pounds of muscle, and I was at like nine percent body fat by the time I was done. Even like some of my castmates were like, "You were, you, you know, you're once for me. Once I flip the switch, it's there's no um, turning back." What does your training actually look like? Like, walk us through a, a training session. Well, when I started SEAL Team. Which so after I after I wrapped that that film or that yeah. series and I came back, uh, Ben Cavall, who was one of the writers on Justified, had sent me an email saying, "Hey, I've got this project SEAL Team, and there's a character Sonny Quinn in here that you're perfect for." That I thought about when I wrote the project, and I was like, I could not be in better shape. Like I'm in the best physical shape I've ever been, in, even more so than the last time he saw me. Um, and it was like a week out I had before the audition came. And I was just so, I felt so good about where I was physically, that full circle of, you know, putting that commitment in and, 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 and sort of taking the time of, while I was away from my daughter, to give 100% to have myself be the best person that I could be to quantify being away from, from my family this opportunity then arises and I'm now in the best possible shape as opposed to going on location, screwing around and not training and which can happen. You know, you get there and it's, you have a, 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 a fun cast and crew and everybody's out every other night or whenever on the weekends. But this, I, I, I definitely isolated myself um, a lot on that one, but it, it turned into this and I went in and um, I had, I, I auditioned for it and then my tape went to CBS and I felt pretty confident with CBS because I had such a great relationship with them and sure enough I'd gotten the offer then for to, for Sonny Quinn and then that's when the real training came in um, there was training that I thought and then there was training with the, our, our SEAL guys which is completely different mentality they just they always say embrace the suck and there's a lot of sucking <laughs> everything about it sucks uh, but it, it, you know, we, you end up like, usually we train, I'll train before we go into work. Usually our work day starts around six or seven in the morning. So I'll usually hit the gym at like three thirty four, Um, and then I'll train for a good hour, hour and a half and then go to work. And then, then we'll be on set for 10, 12 hours out up in the mountains, run up and down hills with about a hundred pounds of gear on us um, all day. But in order to be able to run up and down these hills with this gear on, you have to be able to train this. You can't fake this because all the stuff in, that we wear on the show is all real. Um, so it, it to run up and down the hills and then deliver lines and not be out of breath or not look completely gassed. Um, this season in particular, season five, I've had a a back injury that I've been dealing with, which has been incredibly frustrating because I haven't been able to train the way that I've usually trained. So it's been it's been a struggle. I got injured on SEAL Team in season end of season three, and I was good, and then I did a re-injury again. So it it just uh, and as you get older, when they say, "Yo, oh, yeah, you gotta you gotta just take it slow and ease back in," it's hard with my mindset to to ease back into anything. Usually I'm like, okay, I feel pretty good. I'm back at it. And that's, that's kind of got me screwed a couple of times now. So now 
I've been good and, and, uh, I'm slowly getting back into the training schedule, but it's, you know, you're, you're training at least five days a week, every single morning. Um, and then on weekends you do active recovery, like yoga or some type of, you know, just, just something you're always moving. So an intake of an insane amount of calories because you just need it, you know, three to four to 5,000 calories a day, but you're working out so much. Um, and yeah, it's great. I absolutely love it. Absolutely love it. So, and, and I've become really good buddies with, uh, Max who plays clay on the, on the show and he's the youngest, um, of us all. Uh, but him and I've trained him and I hit the gym all the time together and, and, and train. So, and then, and then a lot of it too is, you know, on, you know, just is, is that same thing it is like, is that when that alarm clock goes off at, you know, three thirty in the morning to get up and train and know you have a good 13 hour day ahead of you and that you've got to do it again the next morning and it's cold, you know, but it, you just sort of, you just, once it's the first week of anything, it always sucks when you get back into it, you're like, oh man. And then it's like your body just, you know, you steamroll through everything. But I did, it, but again, it, I, it, it, there's something about it when you're training that hard and that focused, it's, it's, I really feel like, you know, it, the earth, you know, the, you know, you're seeing things a little clearer, like the, the colors on the tree and in the ocean are just a little bit brighter. Like you've got a clear head, like you're, you're, you know, you're, you're aware of, of a lot more things when you're, when you're putting that much focus in on, on, uh, on training and, and health and fitness. And, and I think those things really go hand in hand success. You know, the greatest wealth in life is health, right? So, and then if you take that and use that, your health to be the, to get as healthy as possible and focus that on success, I think is a good combination, you know, and, and then you're, you're through, through that success comes wealth. It's just, it's this great circle um, yeah, that you can, definitely. Uh, that you can uh, sort of apply to it. But taking care of yourself first is 100% needed in any successful thing in life, whether it's a relationship or whether it's, you know, business. You know, my mom actually gave me this great analogy. Once when I was going through a tough time, she said, look, you're given metaphors every day when you, you know, you travel a lot, AJ, and every time you get on a plane, you're given this great metaphor and you're not seeing it. And that is... You know, if the plane is is going to crash, what does it tell you to do before you help your children? What does it tell you to do? It says help yourself, put the oxygen on yourself, and when you're breathing properly, then you can help your children or your wife or your friend or whoever is beside you. So she you apply that to your life. You know, you got to be a hundred percent with what's going on in you before anything else is going to click. Um, and that was uh, some wise wisdom from. My mom, she's, she's a mad woman, mad Irish woman. Uh, uh, but uh, she uh, she knows her shit. So, um, yeah, so I've applied that. It's true. you got to be 100% for, for anything, whether your job or what you guys do or what I do. If you're not, you know, on point or put the work in and, and prepared, you know, then, you know, you're going to fail. What else have you learned from those who serve as Navy SEALs? Um, so much, you know, that, that could be a whole other conversation. I mean, I really, especially the times that we're in right now, you know, where everyone has, you know, has the ability to stand on ceremony and, and give their opinion and stuff, you know, especially down here in the States, you know, the only reason that any of us can go out and march or, or voice our opinion, whether you agree with the person or, or not, you know, is because of the men and women that have gone and fought for our country and have paid the ultimate sacrifice for freedom to live in this country and to have the freedom of speech, you know, and to, to be able to say things and not be persecuted, to, to be able to, 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 to dress the way you want, to take on the establishment the way you want. That's great. And, and I have asked this, the, the, the SEALs about what's their thoughts on politically. And they're like, my, you know, we fought for people to have freedom of speech. Do I agree with what a lot of people are saying? No. He's like, but that's what I fought for. So I'm happy that people have a place and can say what they want to say. That's what we fought for. It's like when, but when we start 
taking that away from people. He's like, that's not what I that spent 20 years, you know, losing, you know, my brothers over. And I think the SEALs and just the men and women that I've met over the years, you know, their their love for this country and and um, is blown me away. I mean, when you really find out, like, you get into why somebody wants to go overseas and fight and they may never come back because they believe in something that's much greater than them and they want to and they want to take a stand for that that's not taking a stand and you know marching the street and coming up with a chant that's going into harm's way to protect what this is what we have here what you guys have in canada you know and it's it's a, it's scary in the times that we live in that this is being compromised now our our ability to speak freely or speak and, and, and say in any ways of what we want to say um, and or that you can be canceled so quickly or you can be without actual, you know, proper investigation, you know, that people can just say things or things should be dug up from 15 years ago and people can get canceled. It's a, cra it's a crazy world that we live in and that you have to almost in a sense, sense mute yourself because you're afraid to say certain things um, if, out of fear of cancellation. You know, that's or somebody's feelings might get hurt, or or this, and you know, it's like if everybody would just focus on stay in their lane and focus on the three feet in front of them and being a good person, we'd be all good. If 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 less people would worry about what everybody else is saying and what what not what they're doing, you know, it's it. I think that's where <laughs> that's where the train's gone off the tracks a little bit. It's like so many people are worried about everybody else's business and they're not handling it their own. You know, they're not taking care of you know, of themselves or, 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 uh, yeah, they're just, it's just, I don't know. It's, it's, a, it, I'm sure it's frustrating for so many people, and especially you guys as well that are, you know, put stories out there and what you can publish and what you can't. But the one thing I've, I've learned from the seals and, the, and, the, and the men and women is just, um, is that, it, that the ability to, sacrifice for something that's great like that's much greater than anything that you, you and I could do it's not I, I don't know think I don't think I could do that you know you know there's I believe that there's there's you're born a warrior you know like I think you actually genetically are a warrior and I think those people that go off to, to war and, and fight that's a certain type of man a certain type of woman um, I'll fight for the things you know, they control, but going into, going to a gunfight, no thanks. That's, that's fucking crazy. And when you hear their stories of like what they're in, I'm like, I don't, I know I don't, wouldn't be able to compute like, and, and stay calm and like, just have a conversation, you know, and that's what these guys really go through. And then on, not only that, when they go through that, when they come back to society and they have to acclimate back to this craziness, you know, and they some of them when they come back here they see how crazy it is here and they're like fuck I'd rather be on the battlefield, you know it's it's a lot more honest there as they'll say than than here. Yeah. So, um, but I've 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 learned a lot, man, and and it's it you know I've gotten really passionate about it with a lot of the charities that I, um, I I either sit on the board of or I'm just I'm just very very passionate about the veteran awareness and just the struggles that these guys go through when they get come back from from war and there's there's no help there's absolutely no help there's the VA but it's a broken system and these guys have serious traumatic brain injury and, and if it's not documented properly they don't get the right system they're just given pills to take and you know and there's a massive homeless situation with our veterans um, and it's sad because you know you have we we owe them everything but yet you know they're so easily forgotten you know, I mean, it's, who, it's and it's I mean, all the marching that's done. Who's out marching for them? You know, who's out there saying or, or for men and women that have given us the freedoms that we have today? Um, who's out marching for them? So if I can help in any way with the platform that I have with the show, which is the show has been absolutely phenomenal. CBS is 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 and Paramount Plus have really helped out a lot of vets. And on our show, there's over 60 percent of our crew are veterans, guys that have come back from war, literally. Uh, come to our show. They've gotten hired. They, you know, all of our stunt doubles are former spots, um, um, former special operations. Um, they've 
become writers on the show, producers. We've had veterans, you know, some guys from Delta that were on our show that we started off as tech advisors, and by the third season, they were directing, they're producing. So we've done things on this show that no one in the history of television has ever done. So I am the show itself, other than you know the great friends that I've made and and how proud I am of of the quality of show that we made. I'm so proud to be a part of a show that's actually that's kept their word because Hollywood is there's you get let down in Hollywood so much. So so many people are so full of shit. But one thing they have not done is let our guys down. And the, we have men and women on our show that have served, and they've they've done right by them. So I'm I'm very grateful to to CBS and CBS VetNet that has really stood by our 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 vets, and and then uh, and then really integrated our platform to bring awareness of the struggles that these guys coming home. Because what's great about our show is it's not just a show about the battle on the field. It's more so about the battle that they have at home and how hard it is to struggle with being a warrior and coming home and having traumatic brain injury and PTSD and all these different things and, and how going back to society and, and these other issues that you have, how hard it is dealing with a wife and a child and, and, and then being called back again and having to leave again, you know. And I think we've done a hell of a job at showing that you know, peeling, peeking, pe- peeling back the curtain a little bit and just see, sort of seeing a small piece of what these men and women go through and how hard it is for the families, you know, the families of the people that serve what they have to go through. You know, these young moms that sometimes have, you know, they they, they will leave and their 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 dad will never uh, has never met the, the baby. They'll have the baby all their way. And by the time they get back, the baby's a year and a half. You know, like these guys go on long, long deployments. Um, so, and it's just hard, you know. And then the money that they get from the families get while their people are away is, is minimal. So they're, they're struggling and they're over there protecting, you know, um, our country. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's been an absolute honor to be a part of such a great show. And, you know, we're just wrapping up season five. Um, and we've moved to Paramount Plus. Um, and, um, you know, it's been, you know, su- it's such a cool, cool experience to be a part of, of, of this. I feel like we will get a season six. Um, um, and I feel like your stories there have just, um, uh, um, our, our stories there on, on SEAL team are, are, uh, are just getting going. So the first question, I mean, to your, um, I mean, that level of service and sacrifice sounds really Humbling. Um, thanks for sharing that. Uh, are there any daily rituals or routines that you get into that help you um, do the work that you're now doing? Um, one of my best friends, uh, Artie Baxter, who I own uh, the diaper bag company with Paperclip, um, he, when I was going through a really tough time, with my dad and whatnot, it was just when I was getting sort of refocused and stuff. He was like, he's like, AJ, I want you to start this practice every morning. And he goes, it's really going to help with your life. And he's, um, he said, I don't care what you, you say you're thankful for or you're grateful for, but before you start the day, you could say, I'm grateful for the carpet. I'm grateful for the paint. I'm grateful for, you know, the roof over my head. He goes, but I need you to write down 10 things that you're grateful for before you start your day, every single day. And... I start doing that every single morning. And what it does is instead of the regular, um, uh, what do you call it? The regular, you know, you wake up, you're like, oh, I have to do this. I haven't done that. Or what am I going to do? This worry. You start off with this real positive outlook. Hey, I'm grateful that I'm, you know, staring at the water right now. I'm grateful for going to have a cup of coffee, you know, and you just, whatever it is that you do, I do that without fail every single morning. And then if I forget, I'll stop wherever I am and just kind of go through the routine. And it really does something to my brain where you really start off in a really positive way. And then you let these other things, and then you kind of like focus on the things that, you know, you want to achieve within the, the, the day and then I always to my kids that I've always implemented too is just 
is just learn one more thing that you didn't know yesterday. That's all I ask is one more thing. Get Just get slightly better each day. Whatever it is. If you did four push-ups yesterday, do five push-ups today. You know, just do one thing better than you did yesterday. So then you feel like there's growth every day. And it doesn't have to be big. You know, if you did six steps, do six and a half the next day. So every day there's a little goal within yourself of whatever that it is you did. You did one more thing than you did. So you're constantly growing and improving. And I think those two things in a daily ritual are something that um, I do. But the biggest thing is just being grateful. And, and I'm... And, I, and it's not just some ritual that I do, but it's, you know, I, I really recognize that in my life. And um, and I am incredible. Like every day that I drive onto the set of, of SEAL Team, I literally, and I love saying it, I'm like, I'm so fucking grateful for this job. Like I, I love going to work on this job. I look at the big sign on CBS Radford. It's a SEAL Team. I see a billboard that I'm on. It's just nuts. Like I'm, I'm fucking so grateful. Like this is the greatest job I've ever had. I get to fly around in black helicopters and blow shit up. You know, it's like this is, this is a kid guy's dream. So, um, yeah, it's you know, and it, and it, and it, it becomes contagious to other things. And the law of attraction. I'm a big believer in, in that. Um, and then, what was the other question? Uh, what advice would you give to your 20 year old self? Oh man, save money. <laughs> save your money. Uh, no, I, I would encourage me to do the path that I, I was on. You know, just if anything, be. I have more of appreciation of what. The, a day means like what one day means because I, I feel like having kids I've I feel my mortality more so every day you know is it really truly is like it's a gift like you don't we don't know when that final day is so I I really I really you know there, there's there's always going to be a last time that you change your kids diapers or you, last time you have coffee with somebody or you, last time you visit someplace there's always a last time but we're never we don't think that ever so i'm just i'm very uh, appreciative of which i would so what i t i would i would tell my 20, 20 year old self would just be a, be very appreciative of how lucky you are to see the sunrise you know each day that comes recognize that you have that day ahead of you to go and kick ass and that's that's all you should focus on is that day and that day only yeah that's perfect yeah i love that uh that lands hard yeah, yeah. we uh we appreciate your work and uh what's what's coming up next for you what what feel like when you look into the on the horizon what's coming up um well, i have a production company uh called passcode uh entertainment and um, we're about to go into production on two or three projects over the next year that we'll be producing and acting in and, and stuff. So this next year coming, uh, putting on the producer hat with uh, one of my best friends, Andre Champagne, and uh, my other buddy, uh, James Bruce and uh, Anthony Burns. And we're all going to... We've just got a great slate of films and um, got a great opportunity um, uh, with some people that, um, but yeah, we're, we're really excited. We're, we're starting our first one. We'll probably be in um, March in New Orleans. We'll be filming and then we'll bang out two more after that. That's our slate. So we have a slate, but um, I, I can't name the films yet till it's announced officially in the trades. But, uh, but when it does, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll let you guys know for sure. Thank you. Awesome. <clears throat> Is there anything else that you want to uh, promote or let our audience know about? Uh, I have a diaper bag company um, called Paperclip. Uh, you go to paperclip.life.com, and um, my business partner and I, Artie Baxter, uh, we started this. God, 
six years ago, maybe longer. Uh, I mean, there was no changing tables in men's bathrooms. So we designed a diaper bag that kind of folds out into its own changing table. Um, we patented it, and, and uh, um, it's been great, man. It, it's kind of taken off on its own. The pandemic really, really screwed us because of we get it. It's made in Indonesia. It's the very first diaper bag that's um, made out of recycled plastic. It's our, our motto, clean baby, clean earth. Um, but uh, it's a really beautiful bag. Um, by, for somehow a lot of you know the Kardashians and The Rock and a bunch of other famous people have gotten have been gifted it. But what not wasn't through us. But they've all um, had our bag. And then the pandemic came along and really screwed it because it was in Indonesia and just getting things in and out. And so we definitely took a huge hit over the last uh, two years, year and a half. Um, but as soon as things get back up and running again, we'll be slinging more diaper bags. But uh, it's just it's just the getting the, the diaper bags from there over here with all the charges now and the inflation. It costs so expensive to get them over here. So, um, But we still have some on our website papercliplife.com go check them out and it's uh they're not just for dads we really um sort of went through like 12 prototypes and uh it was really our wives that helped us design them we just wanted to make a more efficient diaper bag um and also have an impact on the earth as well and make something that was recycled made from recyclable material which is re recycled ocean plastic and a bunch of um other stuff but a majority of it is recycled ocean plastic so it's pretty cool yeah we're and you can, it's, you can get you can get it at nordstrom's you can get it at um nordstrom's.com and uh amazon bye bye baby but or just our website so yeah that's awesome. it awesome all right guys hey jay this has been uh this has been a real pleasure real honor for us likewise this has been really fun man